If you're a teenager or older, there's a good chance that you hear the word hormone pretty consistently. I mean, I know as an eighth grade teacher, I hear about hormones every single day. But in the grand scheme of things, we really haven't known about hormones for that long. I mean, we've known that glands like the spleen or the thyroid can dump chemicals into the bloodstream since at least the 1700s, but we thought that their job was in modifying blood somehow. Before discovering hormones, scientists thought that the only way the body could communicate with itself was through the nervous system. That isn't to say that we didn't see those big hormone producing glands like the testes or ovaries on dissection, we just didn't know exactly what they did. But all of that started to change when Dr. Arnold Berthold did some experiments in 1848. And fair warning, I'm about to talk about testicles a lot. Okay, maturity. He had this idea that juices in the testes did something, but what? So to start getting some ideas, he took six roosters and put them into pairs. In the first group, he cut off one of the rooster's testicles. On the second, he removed both of them. And in the last group, he cut off both pairs of testicles, but inserted one of them into the other's belly, right in between the intestines. And after a little bit of time, he started noticing some behavioral changes. The totally testicleless roosters got fat and lazy. They stopped chasing after the hens and overall were just way lower energy. But the roosters with one testicle did not. They had pretty similar behavior to before the experiment. They were chasing after the hens, they were pretty aggressive, and forgive the pun, they were pretty cocky. After the experiment, he found that that one testicle was swollen, maybe to compensate for the other one that was chopped off. Okay, but the last group, the roosters with the weird testicle stomach swap thing, they behaved a lot like the one testicle roosters. Bertard repeated the testy trade experiment with different birds and the same thing happened. It didn't matter that the testicle was in a different place than it should be, it still did its job. Or at least the job that it was expected to do. And if you were a typical 19th century doctor like he was, you could explain this new behavior if you saw a bunch of new nerves attached to the donated testicle, right? According to the science of the time, those nerves would be how the body relayed the message that that testicle had to deliver to the rest of the body. But when he cut these birds up, nothing. There were no new nerve attachments like he would have expected. So Bertard concluded that his experiment showed that the testicles secreted something into the bloodstream. He didn't know what yet. And that was it. No big paradigm shift, no fanfare. Like, I don't know what life was like in Europe back then, but if I performed a weird testicle transplant that completely challenged how we viewed an entire anatomical system, that's all I would talk about forever. Which, now that I think about it, is probably why I'm still single. To be fair though, there was a little bit of movement towards modern endocrinology at that time, specifically with how these secretions interacted with disease. Like in 1850, an English surgeon named Dr. Thomas Blizzard Curling, which, wow, what a name, did autopsies on two obese young girls, both with mental disabilities. And what he found was that neither of them had a thyroid. Remember him, he comes back into the story later. There was also Thomas Addison, a doctor who connected dysfunctional adrenal glands that you'd find in the kidneys with a disease that got named after him, Addison's disease. But in particular, it was the thyroid gland in the neck which would really draw a lot of people's attention to what would become hormones. In the mid to late 1800s, scientists and surgeons loved removing the thyroid as a treatment for certain diseases. But even as late as 1879, dudes like Claude Bernard wrote, we do not even have an idea of their utility and of the importance they may have for their removal has not told us anything, and anatomy alone remains absolutely silent. Okay, so back then, a thyroid disease called goiter was a pretty common thing. This Dr. Theodore Coker came along and got really good at removing the thyroid because of it. He had a lot of opportunity to practice. And his cuts were like super clean and crispy. He ended up breaking the post-op survival rate record like multiple times over. Dude was good. But he notices that when he removes the thyroid entirely, there's a chance that his patients actually develop some common symptoms. And they were the same symptoms that Blizzard's case study on the two girls had back in 1850. He and his colleagues tried explaining it. Like maybe the thyroid regulates blood flow and respiration since it's in the neck. He was thinking local action, not body wide. But a few years later, Coker took some thyroid tissue and implanted it back into a patient who had their thyroid removed. And what he found was that some of those symptoms actually got better. He was on his way to figuring out that the gland actually did something, which makes him not only one of the first dudes to do an organ transplant, but also one of the fathers of modern endocrinology. But either way, it wasn't like a big concerted push by all these scientists to find something together. It was kind of a random mess for a long time. That was at least until two English physiologists, Dr. William Bayliss and Dr. Ernest Starling started working together. And these dudes were awesome researchers even before their hormone years. But another name that you might recognize, 
Ivan Pavlov, like the dude who rings a bell and the dog starts drooling, but also you're not totally sure that this dude isn't Santa Claus. Yeah, he comes up again. So during Pavlov's famous research on classical conditioning, he thought that there must be a nerve impulse that takes messages from the gut to the pancreas, which then releases some chemicals. But Bayless and Starling were skeptical. They had stimulated the vagus nerve in animals. This is the nerve that controls the digestive tract and they got nothing. All right then, but that doesn't show that it wasn't other nerves. So they took a dog, detached the nerves near its gut and observed whether the pancreas would still secrete its juices. They put a chunk of acid into the dog's gut to simulate digested food. And sure enough, even without the nerves, the pancreas still secreted its chemicals. The nerves didn't matter that much after all. Even though those nerves got detached from the gut, the pancreas still got the message. This moment was a big freaking deal. It was the first time that scientists had shown that one part of the body could affect another part of the body far away from it through the bloodstream. Of course, anytime you challenge how people think about a generally accepted concept, you're gonna get some pushback. And there was, but this new specialty of endocrinology, the study of hormones, started weaving into medicine pretty quickly. Like doctors started understanding that your body could be influenced by nerves and hormones. And this new concept even started tying together some loose ends of medical misunderstanding. Like some doctors who wondered why women who start nursing experience contractions of their uterus, the hormones. And while their guesses weren't always correct, at least we had a new tool for interpreting the body. So by 1902, Bayless and Starling had changed the game. Endocrinology was about to explode in popularity in the medical field. Except for a big problem. People like puppies. Quick background, scientists sometimes do experiments on live animals. Organs can start failing really quickly after an animal dies. So to buy themselves some time with real life metabolizing body parts, doctors will anesthetize an animal, do their experiment, and then usually sacrifice the animal afterwards. And while you might be shamed for doing it these days, it was really common back in the early 20th century to do these kinds of experiments on dogs. Bayless and Starling definitely used dogs, and sometimes they weren't as respectful and reverent as animal rights activists would have liked them to be. To the point where two anti-vivisection activists attended Bayless's demonstrations, trying to catch him slipping up and then take him to court. They wrote a book, held some riots, and eventually got a lawsuit going. Bayless and Starling won their case though and continued doing research. And this is a big pickle for me because on one hand, I really like dogs and on the other, I really like advancing medical knowledge. So mm. after all that mess, Starling gave a series of lectures at the Royal College of London in 1905 to summarize his and Bayless's findings. And it's where we first heard the term hormone from the Greek hormau, which means to set in motion or arouse. His definition though was really more of an adjustment as opposed to a completely novel concept. Like there's record of scientists talking about internal secretions back in the 1800s, but that kind of phrasing makes it seem like glands are just leaky pipes as opposed to organs, which deliberately give off chemicals to affect the body. To be a hormone, a chemical had to be secreted by a gland in the body, travel through the bloodstream and affect some other body part. And at the time, Starling highlighted a few key glands like the pituitary, adrenal, thymus and thyroid, and the pancreas. He left out the obvious testes and ovaries because even back then, people trying to make a quick buck were selling magic hormone cures to fix deficiencies, we'll say. A legacy that lives on in spam folders today. In Starling's final lecture in the series, he basically talked about how important hormones would be for the future of medicine, and he was right. By the early 1900s, the stage was set for some serious breakthroughs. Scientists and surgeons would be obsessed with hormone imbalances and deficiencies. The next century would feature grave robbing and some dubious science and a lot of testicles. <laughs> in the next episode in the series, we're gonna talk about some of those early experiments and how the brain tied back into everything after all. If you wanna keep up with the hormone saga or learn other cool stories about the body, consider subscribing to the channel. Otherwise, if you wanna support me, please share this video with a friend. You can also like the video and just say what's up in the comments. Have fun, be good. I'll see you next time.